Uh, so first, by way of introduction, the crisis in the wider church and especially the Anglican Communion. I was very glad to see that the Pope has managed to make it to the front cover of Time magazine, though uh, whether he's happy with the headline, why being Pope means never having to say you're sorry, <laughs> is, a, is a key question. But there is no doubt that all the churches across the world are, and particularly my own church, the Anglican Communion, the Church of England, um, but not restricted in any sense to my own church, as I shall mention in a moment, are uh, being li I'm literally torn apart by current arguments over human sexuality, about the issues to do with marriage, issues to do with divorce, issues to do with same-sex marriage, and increasingly gender issues, uh, obviously about the ministry of women and transgender issues. And what I've noticed in all of these debates is that they are debates sometimes represented between the debates, those who want to be or claim to be biblical and do what the Bible says on one hand, and the others. And uh, I was very involved with the Lambeth Conference of Anglican Bishops in 2008, and certainly the more conservative uh, Africans and some conservative Americans were all saying we're biblical and the rest of you have given up on the Bible. But actually I think it's more among those who want to do that. And there are an awful lot of, of labels that are thrown around. Conservatives against liberals, uh, traditionalists against inclusive. It all sounds a bit like Brexit, but, but never mind. Uh, <laughs> um, <coughs> last week, the General Synod of the Church of England was transfixed by this issue, even though the archbishops and the managers had done their best to kick it into the long grass. Um, the way the church, you know, uh, if there's a, um, a fire breaks out in church um, and uh, then the Baptists, my good friend and colleague here, will, will call out for, for water, whereas the Pentecostalists will relish the fire, then the Church of England will set up a working party to look into it. Um, and so the way in which the Church of England is currently dealing with human sexuality as it dealt with the issue about the consecration of women bishops and the women priests is to set up a working party and to try to make sure that they take as long as possible so that uh, any attempt to discuss it while the working party is underway, of course, is pushed to one side. But last July, by an overwhelming majority, the General Synod asked the House of Bishops to produce a form of service, a liturgy, for those who were transgender people who had taken on a new gender and a new name to have a kind of new naming ceremony because they, rather than their, their name they'd been given in their christening. Um, their lordships um, prevaricated and equivocated uh, last term and said, actually, well, look, we have a perfectly good service called the renewal of baptism. That will do. And, of course, as always, that pleased nobody because it didn't go far enough for those who wanted it and it went far too far for the Conservatives. And every attempt to discuss it at last week's General Synod was blocked um, and there were some quite sort of angry questions at, at question time, though they're much politer than Prime Minister's question time, I'm glad to say. But it's an example of, of this crisis. So let me give you two examples. The Anglican mainstream are a sort of pressure group you can see that they say they're Anglo-Catholic, Evangelical, Orthodox, Charismatic, and mainstream. And it's in, so that's a pretty broad involvement of, or pretty broad claim. Um, it doesn't include words like liberal or radical, you'll notice. But it, I've highlighted in yellow from its website that it makes the claim that faithfulness to Scripture as God's Word is essential. And it says at the beginning, it's a community within the Anglican community to promote, teach, and maintain the scriptural truths. And so they are constantly banging the desk to claim that they are biblical and that they're always attacking the leadership of the, particularly the American uh, Episcopal Church and many others for being unbiblical. On the other hand, there's also this group called inclusivechurch.net. And they say, we have a vision of a liberal open church inclusive of all regardless of race, gender, or sexuality. But what's significant is that they also claim, we firmly believe that this vision can, and indeed must, be rooted in the scriptures. And so we have this extraordinary situation that both sides of this debate are appealing to the same scriptures 
and to the Bible. And a lot of my research was done uh, some years back after I was working with Desmond Tutu at the Truth and Reconciliation Commission into the way in which both those who were supporting apartheid and those who were opposing apartheid were also appealing to the, Bi the same Bible. And the same was true, for instance, over the debates about slavery 200 years ago. So that's the purpose of this lecture. What does actually the Bible, and particularly the New Testament and Jesus, have to say about these issues? Um, and just to point out the crisis in the Anglican Communion, to show how up-to-date I am, this is this week's Church Times, the 22nd of February, and has a nice glowing picture of the Archbishop and his wife. And if you go to the webpage for the uh, Lambeth Conference of all Anglican bishops are invited here in 2020, you will find that. On the other hand, the Church Times, as the article said, married gay bishops will be allowed to be present for the first time, but not their spouses. Uh, it was confirmed. And the reason that the Archbishop Welby is given for that, that if the same-sex spouses were invited, there wouldn't be a Lambeth Conference. Um, there are quite a number of married uh, gay bishops, in the, particularly in the American church, um, uh, but there's not, not large numbers of them, and if their same-sex spouses were actually turned up, uh, large parts of the church, both the conservative Americans and certainly uh, in Africa, would not come. Um, Uganda and Nigeria boycotted the, 19, the, the 2008 conference similarly. And so Archbishop Welby has decided to balance two or three American gay same-sex spouses against losing hundreds of African bishops and just saying, OK, we won't have them. But it's caused quite a shock, especially when he puts it next to a nice picture of him and his wife. So my argument begins by suggesting that both society and the church are obsessed with sex and sexual ethics. And in particular, this is threatening to split the churches. Um, I'm grateful to have here with me my colleague who is the Baptist chaplain at King's and also minister of Bloomsbury Baptist Church. And I'm allowed to tell them what has been happening to you. You will instantly recognize him, I'm sure, because he's a great star of YouTube. Uh, he was top 10 on YouTube uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, when the BBC were supposedly making a documentary about his church. And his church is the only Baptist church in central London that will uh, take a gay marriage. And Sam Smith, who I'm sure you all know, is a very important and very prominent uh, pop singer, did the, the theme, the, certainly the school people will know who he is, did the theme for the last James Bond theme. Um, Sam Smith turned up to sing at this wedding, and the BBC filmed it, and it got millions and millions of views. However, a, many of Simon's colleagues as Baptist ministers elsewhere in London will now no longer speak to him, um, one of the Baptist churches in London has left the Baptist um, Federation in protest about the fact that he and his church haven't been kicked out. And the big question about the Lambeth Conference for the Archbishop of Canterbury at the moment is, will that split the Anglican church? So why are we getting, if you pardon the pun, our knickers in a twist um, over this issue? Um, those of you who were here last time for my discussion about money will remember that I said, actually, it's quite interesting that money and wealth and poverty is the thing that Jesus of Nazareth talked about most. One of the things I've been doing <coughs> is a computer analysis of all the texts and verses about key moral issues. And if you look for the texts like money, wealth, poverty, uh, belt, purse, copper, gold, silver, etc. There are some 200 verses in the New Testament about that. If you look up for the theme of, poverty, uh, of power, uh, which is not one of the topics I'm dealing with this year, uh, again, there's about 200 verses. And similarly, if you look up the use of the word life in the New Testament, which is what I will be talking about in April, again, about 200 only a quarter of, those, of that figure comes up for anything to do with marriage and sexuality, divorce, uh, what a porneia, which is a word you're going to hear quite a bit in this, sometimes translated by the, the King James Bible as fornication, but nobody has a clue what that means. 
um, though it's also even used in the book of Revelation for spiritual infidelity, um, in the same way that the people of Israel were accused of infidelity for betraying their God. But at the, the best I've been able to do is to get together about 50 verses. So that suggests straight away that God's priorities are very different from those of the church. He's, on, on a simple thing, like you could say God is four times more interested in what we do about violence and what we do about money than he is about what we do about sex. Now, obviously, that's a gross oversimplification, and I'm sure somebody's already planning a question on it. But it is an interesting thing that actually, if you actually ask, what did Jesus talk about most? Most people don't realize it was money. And Richard Hayes, who is a very significant American uh, New Testament theologian and ethicist, and who is somebody, um, slightly paradoxically, in his major book, The Moral Vision of the New Testament, one of the best <laughs> books on New Testament ethics, or as I used to say, it was the best book on New Testament ethics until mine came out. Um, Richard uh, is acceptable of divorce, but not of homosexuality. But what is interesting is that even he, who is not in favor of uh, gay same-sex relations in the church, even he points out, would that the passion presently being expended in the church over the question of homosexuality were devoted instead to urging the wealthy to share with the poor? Some of the most urgent champions of biblical morality on sexual matters become strangely equivocal when the discussion turns to the New Testament's teachings about possessions. So that's quite a, uh, a very uh, strong comment, I, I think, particularly from somebody, I mean, Richard's a very, very good friend of, of mine, and we, we, we agree on a lot of things, but we disagree on this one. But we both agree that actually compared to uh, possessions and money and so on, uh, that doesn't reflect the centrality of the New Testament on money. But that's the last four weeks. Now, <coughs> those of you who were here last time, I spent quite a bit of time on the methodology that I'm currently using. And I just want to go over that quite briefly today, but not least because I've got a number of people here. And so, um, forgive me if this is a bit quick, but the issues of money, sexuality, power, violence, the meaning, the value of human life confront us all in our daily life. And it's interesting that those are the key issues that every human society has felt the need to make laws or taboos or norms or mores about. And so many people, quite naturally, look towards Jesus and the Bible for help and say, well, what does the Bible say about it? Wouldn't, you know, wouldn't that be, be helpful for us? Um, but in fact, if we're honest, the churches are in just a mess as anybody else. So last time I said that, the, that the, even the phrase the Bible says... No, I mentioned that every time I go to a conference in the States, there's always a nice mahogany cabinet in the corner of my hotel room. And I, I'm, hope springs eternal. I always open it in the hope that it's going to have gin and whiskey and things in it. But actually, it always has just a telly. And there's hundreds of channels and nothing worth watching. But every other one uh, is of an American TV evangelist with a big, heavy black Bible thumping it on the desk and saying, the Bible says. Well, actually, that's grammatically an incorrect sentence. Because the Bible is not a book of ethics, and it's not even a book. Um, ta Biblia, the Greek word that gives the word Bible, is plural. So the Bible say would be correct, or the scriptures say. The Bible is a plural word. It, the, the Bible contains uh, a large number of books, some 66 books, anything between 66 and 100, depending on whether you're Catholic, Orthodox, and which ones you count or not, and whether you include the Apocrypha and the Deuterocanonical books, and I'm not even going to go into what they all mean. But anyway, it's a library written over at least a 1,000 words in a variety of different languages and cultures. And even if one thinks of it as being inspired by God, as I do, and there is a remarkable unity across this 1,000 years and so on, it is still the case that it is plural. And the Bible does not speak with a single voice on anything. I mean, it would be unreasonable to expect a collection of writings over a thousand years to do so. And I said last time, there are, 
<coughs> there are two problems of cultural relativism and the issue of contingency of issues. And that is obviously that cultures vary. And the whole meaning of marriage has changed in different cultures. Some cultures are polygamous. Um, some cultures are much more patriarchal than others. And something like sexuality is a social construct. And what the word homosexuality, for instance, means today is extremely different from what it meant in Roman days, which is itself different from what it meant in Greek days and what it meant in uh, ancient Israel. And so things are relative to the culture. So even when we find a verse that talks about marriage or divorce, does that actually mean the same as what we are talking about today? And then there's the issue about the contingency of issues. So um, whenever you hear on Radio 4, Thought for Day, somebody expounding a long uh, account of one of the patriarchs leading his flocks and his wives, notice, plural, and his concubines in search of water, and then the guy says, and I thought, isn't that just like you and me? I want to say to him, when was the last time you herded a bunch of flocks looking for water along with all of your wives and your concubines? I walked backwards and forwards across Waterloo Bridge uh, between uh, the King's College Strand site and our site on Waterloo, uh, in Waterloo, where a lot of important ethical things are going on in our war studies department and in our uh, hospitals research in guys in St. Thomas's over stem cells and so on. And as I go to a meeting about the ethics of our research, I'm often struck by the fact I know exactly what to do if a Roman legionary stops me on the bridge and asks me to carry his pack, because the Bible tells me to carry the pack the extra mile. I have to say, in 25 years of being dean, I am yet to be asked by a Roman legionary as I cross Waterloo Bridge to carry his pack, but at least I know what to do. But if I go look and say to the Bible, what does it tell me about uh, same-sex marriage? What does it tell me about nuclear war? What does it tell me about stem cell research? The answer is no, it doesn't seem to. And so you cannot ask a modern ethical question of an ancient text. What I've been trying to do with this method is therefore to... But on the other hand, I don't want to say that the Bible has nothing to say. So if we're to avoid the mistake of the American TV evangelists of just reading off the surface, how do we bridge that gap? And I mentioned already that I think that these common human experiences of money, sexuality, meaning, value, power, and so on, are common to all cultures. And actually the way in which most human cultures handle them is remarkably similar. So <coughs> let's look at... Instead of asking, what does it say about stem cell research, let's ask, what does it say about the value of life? Instead of saying, what does it say about nuclear war, say, well, what does it say about warfare generally? Um, secondly, Jesus is not an ethical teacher. There are plenty of those in the ancient world, uh, Socrates, Plato, and so on. He's a wandering prophet and preacher. And what's interesting is that he spends his time mainly preaching the kingdom of God in his words, while gathering together a community, particularly of the marginalized, in his deeds. And I've already said that the Bible uh, itself and the New Testament uh, is not a book of ethics. Um, the genre of the Gospels, and I'll come to that in a minute, means we have to take Jesus' words and deeds into account and use narrative and stories as well as his example um, and his instructions. So if that's all true, if uh, actually there's a lot of material, scriptural material within the New Testament that is relevant to ethics, how do we bridge this gap? How do we make it relevant and helpful for today? Um, the approach I'm adopting flows from my own doctoral research somewhere in the middle of the last century when dinosaurs still ruled the earth. Um, and that is, I was asked myself, um, this very, very important and very complicated academic question, what are the Gospels? Seemed to me to be a rather an important question. I used to be a classics teacher teaching Latin and Greek, and it always seemed to me to be very important. So that, for instance, if I said to you, good afternoon, here is the news, 
you will immediately expect to hear all about what's going on with Donald Trump and Kim Jong-il and what's going on with Brexit. And they always make, they'll have somebody from Mrs. May's office to argue her point and then to provide balance, they'll bring in somebody else from the Conservative Party to take the opposite view. Anyway, um, you, you know, we, that, that's, we all know what news is about. And if I were to say to you, once upon a time, you would expect a story of dragons, knights in shining armor, damsels in distress, and you won't worry if the dragon side of the story doesn't get kind of fair and equally balanced treatment. And what you have just done is genre criticism. You know how to listen to a broadcast, news broadcast, different from how you listen to a fairy story. At least we did until um, Rupert Murdoch came along with cable TV anyway. Um, so the gospel, we have to know what the gospels are if we're to understand them. They have to be composed in, they are composed in the same genre, the same kind of thing as other ancient lives and must be interpreted in that. And there are essentially narratives about a person. But they're very different from modern biographies. And for a long time, the Gospels were thought not to be biographies because they don't look anything like the life and times of Sir Winston Churchill or something. But modern examples are very long, very detailed. Um, after all the work of Freud, they often have a psychological angle, or the work of Weber, they have a sociological angle. And obviously, Marx will tell us you've got to look at it in a person in a political way. They're completely different from what was going on in the ancient world. And one of the other big differences is that very rarely did anybody write a biography of somebody who was alive in the ancient world. You had to wait until they died because the manner in which they died was absolutely vital for understanding their life. It would sum up their teaching and so on. So <coughs> ancient lives, like the Gospels, are a much briefer portrait through the subject's deeds and words and, and this is a big difference from modern ones, but you'll know it if you know the Gospels at all, an extended account of the death, some 25 to 30 percent, somewhere between a quarter and a third of all ancient biographies are taken up with the subject's death. And um, that was my doctoral research that uh, was, came out in 1992, and it's the, or 93, it's the 25th, we've just produced a new 25th anniversary edition of it, and I'm delighted to say they're available for sale next door at the an extraordinarily good price of £35 for an academic book for 500 pages. And I've lugged a suitcase full here, and my good friend Simon and I don't want to have to carry them all the way back. So if anybody would like to go next door and browse the bookstore later, you're welcome to do so. <coughs> After I wrote the big book, a lot of my friends said, OK, Richard, yawn, yawn. You've convinced us. Uh, I, I spend... The, the, I spent a lot of time counting all the verbs in the Greek text to demonstrate um, uh, what the Gospels were about. And they said, yes, but so what? What difference does it make? And I thought, well, so I'll try and write something a bit more general and a bit more accessible and popular. So I wrote this little book called Four Gospels, One Jesus, because I was very struck by the fact in my conversations, particularly with my Muslim students, though it was very common in the ancient world between Christians and pagans, that they will point out we have four Gospels. Uh, the Bible itself doesn't even agree with itself about Jesus. We don't have Jesus, the authorised biography. We have, we, have, we have four portraits, and often my Muslim students will say, and that proves, therefore, that the Quran's account must be the correct one. So why did God, or the early church, think it was a good idea to keep four separate narratives? And they were given these four traditional symbols, and you can see on the cover of this book, uh, in, the, in the four corners of this medieval psalter, there's an ox, a lion, an eagle, and a human face. And I used that image to try to see if I could explain something about Jesus' uh, character and portrait in each of them. And they, unlike a modern biography, about half the text is taken up with narrative and half the text is taken up with deeds. So they set the teaching within the narrative of his deeds. And um, that also came out about 25 years ago. And um, last, a couple of years ago, SPCK brought it out as a classic edition, which made me feel like a Ford Cortina or something. And just amazingly, it's on a very cheap offer, £8 offer today over on the bookstore. Did I mention that? Um, 
The extraordinary thing was that I was actually given the Ratzinger Prize, which the Vatican set up because there's no Nobel Prize for theology, by Pope Francis uh, after a major conference in 2013 on this theme. And as you can see in this picture, I'm presenting Pope Francis with a copy of the book I saw you just now. And uh, it, went, it went on in a mixture of Italian, uh, Latin and English. And uh, the way you get in these sorts of things, basically... Pope said something quite long in Italian, which basically said, what the hell are we doing giving this Anglican priest a prize for? Because they hadn't, they'd only ever given it to Roman Catholics before. Um, that's a rough and ready translation. And then Cardinal Ruini, uh, who um, <coughs> was the cardinal in charge of all of this, went through a long and very involved uh, speech all about the importance of my work, which was lovely. And he basically said, because this guy proved that the Gospels are about Jesus. In fact, well, the, the, what the Italian was of the indissoluble connection of Jesus and the Gospels. So I love the idea that the Pope gave me a prize for counting all the verbs in the Gospels to prove that the Gospels are all about Jesus. Next time I'm going to prove that the Pope's a Catholic. Um, so then I went on to look at the question of how to take the implications of the biographical genre for New Testament seriously. And I've been working on this project, as I say, for about 20 years, uh, particularly in the light of the South African experience. So the first volume uh, about the ethical material found in the New Testament came out in 2007, and just luckily there just happened to be one left of them on the bookstore. And the second part I'm still working on, it was going to be meant to be imitating Jesus and following Jesus, but my American students all told me that actually the subtitle, Set Money, Sex, Power, Violence, and the Meaning of Life, would make a much more um, sexier title on Amazon and things like that than calling it Following Jesus. And um, please God, I'm hoping it's going to be finished next year. What I'm trying to do with this method is to take Jesus seriously as a preacher or prophet of restoration eschatology. Now that's a technical term used in uh, biblical studies. Uh, eschatology is about the idea of the end times. You know, it's a bit like the Michael Palin at the start of most Monty Pythons, where this bearded, hairy person comes out of the desert or whatever and says, it's the kingdom of heaven, uh, rather than Monty Python. And the idea is that at the end of all things, God will restore the kingdom to Israel, hence restoration eschatology. And that's what John the Baptist is preaching. That's what Jesus is preaching. Repent and believe the gospel, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's a very different thing from, say, Plato or Socrates or Aristotle, who are moral teachers giving instructions that they expect to be obeyed. Jesus is primarily a prophet or preacher. Uh, if you're a Christian like me, you also believe that he happens to be the son of God. But he, from a historical perspective, he's uh, a prophet and preacher, of uh, the kingdom of God, and he is seeking disciples. And it, this therefore takes uh, the gospel seriously as ancient biography because you have to look at his teaching and his practice. And I think it's quite interesting that in Luke's second book, the book of the Acts of the Apostles, he says, in my first book, I wrote all about what Jesus began to do and to teach, deeds and words. And so, therefore, we need a narrative approach, an inclusive approach, that not just looking at the question of what did Jesus say. And last time I talked a bit about the fourfold method that we're using, where um, I begin with Jesus' words and deeds and collect as many examples and words as I can say. Like I was saying from the computer search, get them together in the first stage. And then when you've got all that material together, you have to find some way of bringing it into focus. And um, there's another thing that I argue about with Richard, about his use of focal images. And what I'm looking for is what we call a scattergram, in when, when I used to be teaching maths as well, about plotting data on a chart and seeing where the thick line of the results are, a bit like discerning the Milky Way uh, at night, and I'll show you that in a moment. And so what is the direction of travel set by Jesus' teaching an example? And then, thirdly, we look at the four different types or genres of ethical material, rules or commands, imperatives, principles, paradigms or examples. I mean, what you do with a story like the Good Samaritan, go and do likewise. So it's, in, it's not a rule, 
it's not, an, it's not a principle, but it is an example. And what about the overall biblical worldview? And then it's crucial that we apply it within the context of what I like to call an inclusive community of interpretation, which ensures that the voices of those most affected are actually heard. Um, I used to, when I asked my Africana, white Africana friends, why they'd come up with a biblical understanding of apartheid, they said, well, because we didn't listen to the voices of the people who disagree with us. And if elderly white male Afrikaners read the Bible just with other elderly white male Afrikaners and come up with a reading that benefits them, well, there's a surprise. Um, and equally, uh, older uh, male bishops in pointy hats all sitting in a room together trying to decide whether they're going to let women into their club or not. Well, again, they tend to come up with an answer that supports them. You have to listen to those you disagree with. So at the first stage of Jesus' words and deeds, we have to bear in mind that Judaism was a patriarchal society. Women were separated in the synagogue and the temple, or not to be taught the law. One of the rabbis said, if, you, if a man teaches his daughter the law, he might as well make her a prostitute. Um, and the Jewish men in the daily blessings thanked God for making them Jewish and uh, not Gentile and a man, not a woman. And even now, as you can see in this picture, Orthodox men and women will pray separately at the Western Wall. Reform and liberal Jews uh, want to pray with men and women together, and that actually often leads to clashes in Jerusalem. Greco-Roman society was a very similar society. Uh, only um, men were citizens, not women's. Uh, women and children, as well as the slaves, were all viewed as a man's property. And if he chose to kill his wife or his slave or his child, it was not murder, it was destruction of his property. Homosexuality was seen as a kind of normal phase in Greek upbringing, where a young boy would be taken under the wing of an older, um, by young I mean early teens, or by older I mean in their 20s, warrior, taught how to fight and so on. But it would be something that they would then grow out of and go on to marry later which is a very different idea from somebody who is uh, same-sex attracted all the way through their lives. That may have been more appropriate and more common in Rome. So we have to understand that um, it's a very different society, and I've just realised I meant to ask uh, James to check this. So uh, there are going to be two slides the same. I'm, I'm hoping you'll be able to read them. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, Jesus' words and teaching, the key passage in uh, the Bible about divorce is Deuteronomy 24.1, which allows a man to give his wife a bill of divorce if he finds something objectionable about her. And the question, obviously, is, you know, lawyers always love these sorts of things, what is um, something objectionable? And according to Shammai and the conservative school, it had to be something like infidelity. Whereas Hillel and the liberal school says, well, if she burned the breakfast or if what he found was objectionable about her was that she wasn't as pretty as the secretary at the office, then that's enough. And so there was this debate uh, in the first century about what are the grounds for divorce. And Jesus, as a wandering teaching rabbi, is asked by the other rabbis among the Pharisees uh, what he thinks the grounds are. And he returns to the original intention that says, from the beginning, of creation, God made them male and female, and for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. The two shall become one flesh. They are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Now, that's remarkable because that is incredibly conservative. That's way more conservative than the conservative conservatives who did at least allow for uh, infidelity and so on. But Jesus seems to be saying absolutely no divorce whatsoever. And there's a bit of a shift and an argument in the versions of the story as to whether Moses commands it or allows it, which we won't go into now. And that's the same passage done in, in green in a desperate attempt to... Sorry, um, let me just go back. Now, it is interesting that in Matthew's account, the lawyers say to him, can a man divorce his wife for any cause? And obviously that's picking up the debate between Hillel and Shammai. What are the grounds for divorce? And in Matthew's account, Jesus says, whoever divorces his wife except for pornea, mei epi pornea, 
and marries another commits adultery, moichatai. Now, how you translate this word porneia is really complicated. If you look at biblical translations, certainly King James called it fornication. Uh, some modern ones say unchastity. Other people say sexual immorality. And in this case, quite a lot of often people say anyone who divorces his wife except for adultery. But we know that adultery is a different word because we have it later in the sentence, moichatai. So what does porneia mean? Well, you might guess from the first four words, uh, for four letters, porn, where we are going. In Greek, uh, a porne is a prostitute, a porneon is a brothel, uh, porneos is the brothel keeper or the pimp. So it's about selling sex for money, um, whereas traditionally, of course, it, uh, it's just this word uh, fornication. So even actually what the word means has changed. In Matthew chapter 5 and Luke 16, there's a repeat of this saying, but once again, Matthew inserts except for porneia. Now, Matthew is probably in a more conservative Jewish Christian group, and so he is going with the conservative interpretation of Shammai, except for porneia. But Jesus says that defilement comes out of the heart. What goes into somebody cannot defile them. You don't, you're not defiled by the body, but by the heart. And this was crucial in the ancient world for this notion of impurity. And it seems that Jesus was actually saying the real impurity is in the mind, not necessarily in the body. <coughs> the other thing that's quite surprising about Jesus is that when uh, the Sadducees come to him with the seven brides for seven brothers question, um, uh, and ask him when she's married seven brothers and whose will she be in heaven, he says that marriage is only for this life only. And that he doesn't therefore suggest that marriage is not so important. And that's about all Jesus has to say. Okay, he has lots to say about money. Also, when particularly our American friends talk about, uh, or the Daily Mail talks about Jesus as a supporter of family values, I wonder if they've actually read the New Testament recently. When he comes home with all of his friends, uh, and the house is packed out in Mark chapter 3, he's told that his mother is at the door. Now, if you're a good Jewish boy and your mother is at the door, you get there pretty damn quick or you'll get a clip around the ear. Where what Jesus says is, my mother, brothers and sisters, they're the ones I'm with. They're the ones who are seeking the will of God. It's a deeply offensive comment. Or when somebody says, oh, look, I want to follow you, but um, I must first go, let me go and bury my father. Jesus says, leave the dead to bury the dead. Come and follow me. So the idea of Jesus as a prophet of family values is quite an interesting one. He seems to suggest that actually the call of God takes priority over everything. And when the rich young man refuses to follow Jesus because he has to sell everything, Peter says, look, we've left everything. Homes, fields, families, wives. And Jesus promises that you'll get a hundred times more of that in heaven. So on the one hand, he's very conservative in his teaching and in his attitude. On the other hand, he is accused regularly of being the friend of sinners, a glutton and a drunkard. And he spends all his time with the wrong sort of people not the sort of person that a conservative ethicist would want to spend time with. There, there's an extraordinary story of a woman anointing him in all four Gospels. It's very complicated because in some accounts it's the head, in some accounts it's the feet, and in some accounts she's using her tears, and in some accounts she's uh, using ointment. But in all the accounts, what is interesting is that everybody is shocked about the fact that this holy man, this rabbi, allows this woman to touch him particularly in some verses where she's described as a sinner. And if he were a prophet, he would know this, because what she's doing is transmitting her impurity to him. And yet he accepts her. And then there's the story of him meeting a Syrophoenician woman up in what we would now call Beirut. And she's a non-Jew. She wants him to heal his daughter. And he says, it's not right to give the children's food to the dogs. Now, this is another incredibly offensive saying. Dogs is what Jews would call non-Jews, Gentiles. He's basically saying, go away. And I could use slightly stronger language if you like. Um, you know, this is for Jews only, not for dogs. 
and she says, but Lord, the dogs can pick up the crumbs that fall from the table that the children don't want. And Jesus says, again, my rough translation, nice move, sister, your daughter is healed, well done. Fantastic faith. And it's almost as though this challenge of this woman changes Jesus' is calling and he realises that if the Gentiles want what he's offering and his fellow countrymen don't, he will heal for them. On his way to uh, rescue the daughter of Jairus, who is dying, um, a woman with uh, the, what's called a flow of blood. In other words, it, it's a condition where you, the woman is constantly menstruating. And women are impure, according to the law, during their monthly period. So a woman who has a constant flow of blood is constantly impure. And she must not go to the synagogue. She mustn't touch anybody and things like that. And Jairus, as the leader of the synagogue, would have known who this woman was. And in the crowd, she touches Jesus. And normally, the flow would be that her impurity would make him impure. What happens is that his purity and his holiness heals her and he realizes that because he feels the power going out of him and he says hey who touched me and Peter says oh don't be so bloody stupid master we're in the middle of a huge great crowd of course everybody's touching you (laughs) but he says no somebody touched me and she has to admit it and he says daughter your faith has made you well he stops to heal a woman and an impure woman And we see women disciples who are actually named in Luke chapter 8 and Jesus accepting Mary in Luke chapter 10 when she is sitting at his feet, which is only what men do to a rabbi. And her sister Martha says, Jesus, could you have a word with my lazy sister and tell her to come and join me in the kitchen and do the women's work? And Jesus says, no, she's chosen the better part. If Mary wants to be the man's part, sit at my feet, fine. So I talked earlier about the scattergram. Here is a picture of the Milky Way. And I, I'm very influenced by the work of a French-Canadian uh, Jesuit, Guillemet, when he talks about uh, that Jesus is not about giving moral or ethical directives, but a direction. So instead of directives to be obeyed, it's a direction of travel. And I, this idea of using plotting data to get the general direction or the overall trend, like trying to discern the Milky Way in the night sky. And what we've just seen is in Jesus' preaching of the kingdom of God, that's a challenge to his contemporary society and of ours. And his words are an incredibly high and demanding, and even, if I use a label, conservative ethic. But his deeds, he lives out his teaching as a single person, very rare. A rabbi was expected to be married. He seems to embrace an ascetic lifestyle. He doesn't have any money. He's just wandering. And yet he's surrounded by women. And in fact, his mission is funded by some rich women, according to Luke chapter 8, including somebody who's the wife of one of King Herod's um, cabinet ministers. He accepts sexual sinners among his disciples and his followers. And the other guardians of morality are shocked and describing him as a drunkard and a friend of sinners. And there is this odd contrast between his very demanding teaching and his very open and acceptance of people. Now, I'm going to have to skip over some of the other material because the rest of the New Testament, can't, we can't do it all. But just very quickly... Um, Matthew keeps talking about adultery and he also makes provision for those uh, who wish to be eunuchs or celibate for the kingdom. We notice that if you look at Luke, he doesn't have the story where Jesus um, is, says to his mother, these are my brothers, and he admits the divorce pericope, which shows that, that that's quite and raises an interesting question. But when we look at Luke's gospel generally, Here is the one where we get the names of women disciples. Here is the one where Mary is allowed to sit at Jesus' feet like a man. There are lots more healings and ministry to women in Luke's Gospel. And constantly women are named. Uh, Mary uh, and singing her Magnificat. Elizabeth with Zechariah. Anna with with Simeon. He tends to uh, pair women and men together. 
In John, we have this extraordinary story of Jesus speaking to a Samaritan woman at the well who's had many men. Now, he shouldn't be talking to her because he's a Jew and she's a Samaritan. He shouldn't be talking to her because he's a man and she's a woman. And he certainly shouldn't be talking to her if her reputation is well known. And his disciples, who have gone into town to try and buy lunch, when they come back, they're quite shocked. And yet he is the one who talks to her and offers her living water. And then there's the story of the woman taken in the very act of adultery. Now, if she was captured in the very act of adultery, as far as I'm aware, that includes that means two people. Where is the man? Is he sort of hopping around Jerusalem somewhere with his trousers around his ankles, or what? And if they're going to talk about the very act of adultery, surely they should bring both. In other words, it's a setup. And they bring this woman, and they... they they, they want to try and trap Jesus. And he comes up with the response, okay, yep, quite clear. The law says adulterers should be stoned. That's what the law says. So, whichever one of you is without sin, you can throw the first stone. And then he bends down and writes in the sand. And we don't know what he writes in the sand. Maybe he writes greed. His wife beat her. You know, there's a tradition he's writing down the sins of the people in the group, and one by one they slip away. And she's left with the one who is sinless, the one person who has the right to throw a stone at her. And he says, I don't condemn you. You're free to go, but stop staying. In the Acts of the Apostles, the apostolic decree for Gentiles removes the requirement for circumcision and keeping the law. But it does say, stop... Um, don't eat meat that's been sacrificed to, ang to idols or that has blood in it or what's been strangled, but also from, and again, notice the English translation is fornication, but it's from porneia. And there are women active in the ministry throughout the whole of the book of Acts. Paul is often seen as somebody who's very anti-women. There's a big section in, in Corinthians, about 1 Corinthians 5 to 7, but it's mainly about divorce. But it's Paul is the person who comes up with the phrase, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. Paul is the one uh, who also tells them to abstain from porneia, again, same word. And in the house codes for uh, how people are to behave, there's a great strength on mutuality. Normally the ethics were um, simply this, wives obey your husbands, slaves obey your masters, children obey your parents. But in the New Testament, we find it says, uh, husbands, love your wives and sacrifice yourselves for them. Masters, remember you have a master in heaven. Fathers, do not be harsh with your children. There is a, a common thing of vice lists in ancient ethics. We have a long list of, of naughty people, basically. And it is true that in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, the vice list includes that a long list of people who aren't going to get into heaven, and it includes um, all sorts of people like gossips, and drunkards and gluttons and all the sorts of things that heterosexuals often get up to. Uh, it also includes the words pornoi, so that's people who do porn, moichoi, which is adulterers, and then malakoi and arsenokoitai. How do we translate those terms? Malakoi means softies. Malakos is just the verb for soft, uh, the adjective for soft. And arsenokoitai means people who lie with men. And so there's a great debate about how you translate the words and do those words actually have anything to play with what we call homosexuals today. And this idea of a vice list is very, very common. And there's a whole list of them there I've just given you. And pornea occurs in most of them some 11 times. But they don't mention homosexuality. And in Romans chapter 9, one of the main things where it does talk about homosexuality, it's in the context of another vice list where Paul says all sorts of people deserve to die, including children who are disobedient to their parents. And so people who take Romans 1 and apply it against, uh, against uh, homosexuals should also be executing disobedient children, if you think that's what the text is trying to do to give you those instructions. Paul was also single. He may have been a widower, but he certainly claimed the right to, to have a wife. 
Um, he's often seen as the person who has a negative attitude to women from some of his comments about headship and being silent in, ch in church. But we've already so seen the key text that there's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male or female. We're all one in Christ Jesus. Remarkably, Paul commends a number of his co-workers, Euodia and Syntyche, Chloe, Phoebe the deacon, and other named women. And most remarkable is Romans 16, 7. He says, and this is the NRSV translation, Andronicus and Junior, my relatives who were in prison with me, they're prominent among the apostles, and they were in Christ before I was. They were Christians before me. <coughs> that means that he is describing Junior, a woman, as an apostle. Most other translations actually use the much rarer name, Junias, which is the masculine version. We have no other example of the word Junias in the ancient world. It's, uh, it should be Junior. But if it is a man, well, then we've got a same-sex couple. So either way, we've got an interesting statement of what an apostle is. In the rest of the New Testament, a marriage is described to be good in 1 Timothy, second marriage is allowed. Um, the arsenikoitai, the men liars, feature only once in a Levice list. Faithfulness in marriage is stressed in Hebrews. So in summary, there is a general idea of one flesh, one man, one woman for keeps, asserted by Jesus in Mark and Luke, picking up Genesis 2.24, and it's quoted by Paul in 1 Corinthians 6. But interestingly, homosexuality is not even mentioned by Jesus, and is actually quite rare in the New Testament. <coughs> I'm going to cut out section 3 and move to the end. So in summary, we've got that Jesus um, reaffirms Genesis' idea of one flesh, and there is a clear opposition to pornea, whatever that means, and he lives it out in his own ascetic single life, but accept sexual sinners among his group. Matthew and Paul are clearly trying to apply Jesus' teaching in the real world to the practical issues facing their congregations. And Luke, we've seen, is particularly sympathetic to women. There's a clear antagonism to pornea across all New Testament writers. And homosexuality is only a minor issue in vice lists. The commands are against pornea. And so the church's negativity to sex does not reflect the biblical view. And it's the current inconsistency over how the church handles divorce as opposed to homosexuality, or how it treats women, especially in ministry, does not reflect what the New Testament teaches. So I'll go back to my Milky Way. Jesus' words and deeds give us a direction rather than directives. It is a call to take up the cross, to deny yourself and follow him, which is costly. It gives us some content, but it doesn't answer our modern questions. And the New Testament is much more concerned about issues of money, violence, and power than it is about sex, marriage, and divorce. And one has to ask the question, does the church follow God's priorities, as in the Bible? And what about the overriding biblical ethic of love in Jesus' example of accepting others? So how can we interpret these scriptures in what I call an inclusive community which allows for the voices of those who will be affected to be heard, women, LGBTI+, plus, and others. How to build a community that will do that response to Jesus, that makes us friends of sinners, or to be judgmental, excluders. How do we use the New Testament in issues of, of sexuality in society and the church today? And are, uh, is it consistent in allowing for divorce, for instance, but opposing homosexuality? Divorce and second marriage was not allowed in the Church of England for many years, which is rather ironic, considering it all started with Henry VIII uh, and his divorce. Um, today, there is it's widespread uh, premarital sex and cohabitation. I know very few clergy who marry couples with different addresses. And increasingly, christenings are being seen as the first big family celebration. And the Church of England has now brought out an order of service for a christening and a wedding combined. And I've done one of those. You know, I was asked to uh, christen a, a child who was about three or four, but the parents weren't married. So I said, fine, let's, let's, we'll just wrap it all up into one big service. And they came in with the child. And, it, and it, it, it. The ordination of divorcees in the Church of England were not allowed for many, many years. And one of my friends who was engaged to a divorcee had to wait until her husband was killed in a car crash before he was allowed to be ordained. Uh, now it's allowed by an archbishop's faculty, and there's been big debate over whether divorcees can be bishops. 
it took us some 25 years for the argument about women to be ordained as priests and another uh, 17 years for women to be consecrated as bishops. At the moment, the Church of England clergy are not allowed to bless civil partnerships, but clergy are allowed to be in a civil partnership. But same-sex marriage are not allowed in certainly the Church of England at all, and as I'm saying from Simon's experience in many other churches. And certainly active uh, homosexuals or people in a same-sex marriage um, are very, very difficult for ordination and certainly not consecration as bishops in this country. So, I love this. Why are some scriptures about homosexuality considered to be binding today? Leviticus 18.22 forbids homosexuality. And here is the, from the Westboro Baptist Church, where they're famous for saying God hates fags. Not knowing that Leviticus 19.28 forbids having a tattoo. Having a tattoo is as much of an abomination to God, according to Leviticus, as being homosexual. Are permanent lifelong monogamous same-sex relationships equivalent to Christian marriage? And of course, we're just beginning to grapple with the debate about transgender people. Sorry, I've overrun just ever so slightly. We've got time, I think, if Lucia runs around very quickly with a mic for a couple of questions. And um, I'm very happy to hang around after the end of the formal hour for other questions. But who would like to ask? Thank you.